If you're having trouble swallowing food, be assured it's a common GI symptom and the vast majority of the time the food passes safely to your stomach but rarely food does get stuck. We call that a food impaction. It's an emergency and we'll discuss in this video what it is, why it occurs, and how to fix it. Hi, I'm Mark Cooper. As a GI doctor, a food impaction is an emergency I help manage. What is a food impaction? Who would have ever thought that that could be a problem of your esophagus? It's when food literally gets stuck in the esophagus. It can't go down into the stomach and you can't regurgitate it back up. Now this is much rarer than the more common symptom of dysphagia, which is trouble swallowing. So how would you know the difference between dysphagia that we need to get an appointment for and see in the office versus a food impaction that I need you getting in the car and going over to the emergency room? The key is that you won't even be able to swallow your own saliva when you have a food impaction. You're gonna notice it because you're gonna be drooling on yourself and you're gonna be extremely uncomfortable. So it's usually not a very subtle thing. When a person arrives in the emergency room, there's some initial management that an ER doctor can do to help. And so a fair portion of the time, a GI doctor never actually becomes involved. They may ask you to swallow a carbonated beverage, though usually people have already tried that at home. But they have a few other tricks that they can offer as well. And one of those is a medication called glucagon, which helps to for smooth muscle in the esophagus to relax, which may ease the passage of that food that's stuck. But eventually we're gonna to get to the point where we need to consider doing an endoscopy and taking you back into the endo suite to perform an EGD and dislodge that food. All right, now let's pause a second before we just rush off to the endo suite. Why is this such an emergency? It's because some of the complications that can occur because of that food being lodged there. One of which is that the esophagus itself can tear and that opens up into the precious territory around your heart and lungs. Another problem is that you can develop a fistula, which is a pathway between the esophagus and a nearby organ that was never meant to be there. Think of this as a tunnel that can form into the aorta and cause a very large bleed or into your trachea, your air pipe. And that means food is gonna start dumping in there, which is also something you certainly don't want. Now those complications take time to develop. When we're looking at the timing that we need to perform an endoscopy, we've usually thought this is within about six hours of someone arriving in the ER. One of my colleagues, Dr. Tim Krill, recently published a paper which looked at the effects of people who had a delayed endoscopy over 12 hours, and it found that they really didn't have a higher rate of complication. And that's because really no matter what, if you're in the ER, this is gonna be done within pretty short order, within a day. While you're waiting, it can be helpful to get a suction equipment so that you can clear the saliva, and it can also be helpful to get some medicines to help with the anxiety that people often feel suffering these symptoms. With that said, let's go into the endo suite. We have a separate video in which we discuss what an EGD entails in more detail. There's some special considerations for this procedure. The first is that you need to have airway protection. I accomplished that in one of two ways. I either asked for the help of anesthesia to place an endotracheal tube. This is where we think of someone basically being on a breathing machine. By having a tube down into the airway, it assures that there's protection of any contents coming up out of the esophagus. My other option is to place a tube down into the esophagus. In this way, anything that I'm pulling up out of the esophagus has a clear pathway out past the vocal cords and into the clear territory out of your mouth. Once the endoscopy is underway, our first order is to find where the food is impacted. Sometimes it's very near the vocal cords, just inside the esophagus. Other times it's down deeper. Occasionally, it turns out that once a person's received anesthesia and they've relaxed, the food will actually spontaneously pass on its own. But most of the time when we're at this point, we're finding food that we need to dislodge. We have several techniques to deal with that. Sometimes we see if we can gently push the food onward. It may just need a little extra nudge to get down, but I don't like to be very aggressive about that because I don't know what's passed. And so I wanna only do that when I'm sure that I have good visibility through the esophagus. More often what I'm doing is trying to remove the food up and out of the mouth. And I'm accomplishing that with a number of tools that have names that evoke different animals. There's a rat tooth forceps, alligator forceps, and there's the talon grasper. All cool devices that help me grab food, get a good secure hold of it, and pull it up. There's also some nets that can be used because this is kind of like a fishing expedition. There's also a snare, which is kind of like a cowboy using a lasso to round up some cattle. Yank that piece of beef back up out of your esophagus. It also helps to just clear everything out with a warm water lavage to ensure that everything is washed down into the stomach that's left over. The next step is to take biopsies of the esophagus so that we can find out what the cause of this is. So why does a food impaction occur? Many times it's because instead of the esophagus being a 
slick, smooth surface like a water slide. It's like coarse asphalt. And this can occur because of eosinophilic esophagitis or also severe reflux disease. Other times, impaction occurs because the esophagus is narrowed. And this might be a late consequence of GERD in which there's a stricture. Other times people have things called stenosis or a web or a ring. And these are all variations of speed bumps and narrowings in the esophagus that slow food down and make it get stuck. Something to reassure you of though, is that it's very rare that someone with esophagus cancer presents with a food impaction. More typically, those people note trouble swallowing and they're spontaneously regurgitating the food. It's not getting stuck. So we've gotten the food cleared out of the esophagus and we've taken biopsies to determine why this occurred. The final thing that I like to do is a dilation. Very often people will have these symptoms recur sooner than the time it takes for the medications to work. And so doing a dilation there at the time of the initial food impaction is a helpful way to ensure that the person goes home less likely to have recurrent symptoms. Recent paper has shown that when people get a dilation at the time of the initial food impaction, it's actually quite rare that there's any complication. We've historically been concerned that because the person just had this impaction that we would cause a perforation by doing the dilation. But that really doesn't turn out to be the case. And I think most often it's helpful to the person to have a dilation right then and there, unless I'm really concerned that their esophagus looks severely damaged at that moment. That wraps up the endoscopy. We complete a look into the stomach and the small bowel as well. But once you're done with the endoscopy, you can very often go home. And you're gonna do so on a couple of new medications. One of those is gonna be a proton pump inhibitor. And we talk about that medication in detail in a separate video, but the goal here is to reduce acid production. And that can often help many of the conditions that cause these food impactions. The second medication that people may often need to be on is called Caraphate. And it's a medication that coats any ulcerations to ensure that those heal up nicely. So often these food impactions occur in the middle of the night because somebody had steak for dinner. A lot of this is just gonna be a blur. And that's the reason to make these videos is so that you have helpful information afterwards. But it also means that we need to follow up in the office. We need to see how you're doing after a few weeks on treatment. And we probably need to plan a repeat endoscopy so we can take a second look to ensure that the esophagus is healing and whether it needs any further dilation. We'll also in the office have biopsy results so we can discuss if you have a condition like eosinophilic esophagitis and make plans on how to treat that underlying condition that caused this problem. So if you're in the ER right now with a food impaction, I want you to know that you're gonna be able to be taken care of, that you very unlikely have cancer, and that you're gonna go away feeling much more comfortable. I hope that this has been helpful to you. If it has, please subscribe to our channel as we will have more videos about the dilation and other procedures that we do to help these conditions. Thank you for your time and be safe.